Well, I'm here today with uh, with my very good friend, Colin Percival, who's uh, very well known to, to many in the uh, UK, uh, certainly one of the most experienced explorers uh, in the North Sea. Colin, we're going to, jo we're going to talk today about uh, the most expensive dry hole on the planet. Thanks, Mike. What a pleasure it is to be here today to actually talk about Mukluk One, uh, drilled several decades ago and still the most expensive dry hole on the planet. BP Alaska was looking for somebody to actually go and do a lot of field work. In 1983, I was on a field survey in Alaska, looking at all the major reservoir and source intervals. And soon thereafter, BP was a partner in Mukluk One. So when they were looking for a rig geologist to go out there, and my name was on the list, and uh, I went out there. So you were, you were telling me that... Uh... During your field trip, um, you had a couple of weeks of, uh, of very, very pleasant conditions, and then it all went horribly wrong. Yes, uh, Alaska has a few um, uh, issues with doing field work. Uh, on the larger side are the uh, grizzly bears, uh, <laughs> which you need to take a shotgun with you, just in case you encounter one at close range. Which you did, I understand. Yes, we did, we did. You don't want to shoot the gun, but you need one with you, just in case. And uh, perhaps more... Um, more of an issue as a smaller varieties, the uh, the mosquitoes, which um, you know, once they hatch, are hell. <laughs> and uh, you were saying that you were absolutely, you could hardly eat a sandwich without them landing on you in in the swarms. Yeah, we used to sit there waiting for the chopper take it, to take us back to base camp, and uh, use our field notebook or map case to hit each other on the back and count the number we killed which was generally around 20 to 25 on each hit and you didn't wait long between it successive ones which just shows you how dense they were <laughs> and uh, some days yeah you wouldn't even take off your your mozzie net to eat your sandwich it was so bad sounds uh, sounds just like uh, rannick moor on the west coast of scotland for anybody <laughs> who knows it but anyway yes the uh, the, the national uh, the national bird of scotland so, Colin, you went from the field trip. How did you get involved with the, the drilling of uh, the Mukluk well? Well, the field work was to uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Range, which is actually shown on that map there, uh, Mukluk 1, offshore in, in Harrison Bay. We had actually looked at all the key intervals that that well was going to penetrate. So having had experience in well site geology and in the local geology um, was the reason I got chosen to go out to the Mukluk One well. I should say it's named after a welly boot, Mukluk, so it's a canvas version of a welly boot. Um. <laughs> so you were with BP, but it was actually being operated by Sohio. So why was there a BP job? And this is before BP took out Sohio. So what, how were you involved? Yeah, well, the, the well itself was actually drilled at the uh, junction of four uh, tracks. And essentially, all because it was such an important well, all the main partners in all of those tracks had a well site geologist for the reservoir section. So, so how many were there? There was about half a dozen for the reservoir section. Half a dozen so geologists. Sahio uh, was the operator. BP at the time had a 54% equity in Sahio, mm -hmm. um, but had its own equity interests in licenses and fields in Alaska. So both Sahio and BP bid on these tracks. Yeah, 11 companies were were actually involved in the, the, the drilling of the well and uh, the slide showing uh, the names have changed over the years. So so why were the expectations so very high for Mukluk? What, what was it about this prospect that was capturing everybody's imagination? It was a lookalike for, for Prudhoe Bay, which sits immediately adjacent and down dip. So same reservoir interval, same source rock, same trap type. It was just a little bit smaller and indeed a little bit shallower. Prudhoe Bay is the biggest oil field in the USA. Prudhoe Bay itself is uh, 12 billion uh, barrels recoverable and 22 TCF. And it was a long trend? It was right, it was the, yeah. the next door one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Prudhoe Bay is a subcrop trap to the base Cretaceous unconformity, and that unconformity uh, is onto a ridge, and that ridge, the Barrow Arch, rises towards the northwest. So you have Prudhoe Bay, and then upped it from that, you had Mukluk, upped it from that, you had another feature called Akali. And then eventually upped it from that, you have surface oil seeps at Barrow Point. The play is exactly the same as Prudhoe Bay. So the main reservoir interval is the Ivy Shack, which is of Triassic age, which subcrops the base Cretaceous unconformity. Uh, the source rocks mainly sit above that in the Shublik, which is Triassic, and the Kingak, 
which is Jurassic. And then cutting across that, as you can see on that diagram, big unconformity. And I think at the time of the drilling, uh, about 1.5 billion barrels of uh, prospective resource. It was expected to be, potentially, if it worked, a very, very large oil field. And indeed, yeah, a number was quoted of about 1.5 billion. Uh, that was at the lower end of expectations pre-drill. Certainly, I think Sahio were carrying double that number. You head on over from London, uh, you get to Anchorage, you get all the way up to the North Slope. And, and uh, how did you get out to this uh, island uh, that, that was right in the middle of the Arctic Ocean? So, so you got a boat out to the rig then, did you? You can only do that during the summer, Mike, because during the drilling season, which is during the winter, um, it's all pack ice. So the way out there is essentially by road from Prudhoe Bay to Milne Point, which is uh, an oil field. At that time, it wasn't developed. But there was a base camp there. And then from Milne Point, you either go via the ice road, shown on the map by that dark black line, or as we did, you basically take a chopper out to the gravel island where Muckluck was drilled. So that would have been useless. I'd have been bringing my uh, swimming trunks with me. But uh... <laughs> we had, the, the, the rig had to have uh, lifeboats, though, because it was an offshore operation. Ah, yes. No open water for hundreds of, uh, of miles. <laughs> and... Uh, in terms of things like H2S uh, leaks, you had to have uh, breathing equipment uh, because it was an offshore well. But actually, you could just walk away from it because it was just pack ice all the way around. As long as there weren't any polar bears around. Yeah, we didn't see any of that. Ah, oh, see okay. That. So the grizzlies were up in the mountains, <laughs> but uh, you didn't uh, you didn't see any polar bears. That's good. So run me through the uh, what what the wells cost again. You, the, there was the gravel island um, that was that was built at, at huge expense. Yep, Gravel Island was built as an early production system because people thought the risk was so low with Mucklock. The island cost about 100 million bucks. I'd say the drilling was relatively cheap because we're just using a standard land rig, essentially, okay. offshore. So the, the main cost was in the leases. Roughly one and a half billion was spent on leases over the Mucklock structure. The well itself was drilled at the junction of four leases. The combined cost of just those four leases was was about one and a half billion. So that was back in 1983, and we're talking about the best part of two billion dollars. Yeah, it was a very expensive operation, but people thought it was going to be Prudhoe Bay too. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we've done a calculation, and uh, 1983 dollars, if we inflate it to today, uh, we estimate that that's round about six billion dollars. That is the world's most expensive dry hull. It certainly is. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so what went wrong? Well, I arrived at the well site. When oh, we... it was your fault. <laughs> <laughs> not totally, not totally. <laughs> I arrived at the well site when we were just about uh, to drill out the casing and go into the reservoir section. Right. And we were going to pour on the presence of reservoir and shows. And indeed, that's what we had as soon as we drilled out the cement plug. We found over a thousand foot of oil-stained reservoir with a small oil column at the top of 11.7 API oil, about 30 foot. So the reservoir had been full at one stage? It, yes, the reservoir had been full. So there had been a huge paleo column at Mucklup and we had a sand on the unconformity surface hmm. and that was the most likely leakage point in the trap. So if it leaked on there, where did it end up? Well, we obviously had a, a huge paleo column here in the billions of barrels, um, during the tertiary, there'd been a tilt and it looked like the oil had migrated up through that, that Cretaceous sand up dip into the Kuparak oil field, which was onshore, which at the time we were producing 100,000 barrels a day from. So, you know, we just had an extensive sand on the unconformity surface, which you don't get at Bruno Bay. Tough luck at Mucklock, huh? Absolutely. Probably some of the oil in the system leaked to surface uh, uh, historically or through geological time at Barrow Point. Definitely, definitely. It's a very, very oily province. So that large area in front of the Brooks Range is basically an oil kitchen, the whole of it. And it all dips up towards the Barrow Arch, which runs through Prudhoe Bay and Muckler, and eventually comes out near the surface at Barrow Point, where cool. all the oil seeps are. And there's tons of source rock. Tons <laughs> of source rock. 
There's all sorts. There's all sorts of potential up here. All sorts, yeah. Um, you know, particularly uh, with regard to uh, unconventional resources. But there's still an enormous amount of conventional resources to be found. And indeed, uh, you know, there's a number of companies who are involved, and and we're actually tracking those. And uh, the, all that data is actually captured in our uh, in our trove. Uh, well, it, which covers the entire Arctic Ocean, in fact, and and uh, certainly. This area is is very very prolific. Yeah, no, it is very very prolific, and of, of course, to date, the exploration has been mainly onshore or along the coast because of pack ice offshore, and the difficulty is in in drilling that. All operations have to take place during winter when the ground is frozen. For years, there's been talk about opening up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to exploration. Because what, what are your views on that? Well, to date, there's only ever been one well drilled in that entire area, okay. which is KIC-1, again, drilled near the coast. And it has all the same ingredients as we see at Pudo Bar. So potentially uh, another huge uh, petroleum province in the US uh, that is, uh, hasn't been accessed to date. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. It's a bit like the uh, the whole eastern seaboard. I mean, you know, there's been a couple of dozen wells from from basically from from Maine all the way down to Florida. Hardly any drilling at all. Nothing in the last few decades, and a massive potential and a a, a huge passive margin. Yeah, absolutely. And and of course, to the east of Anwar, you go into the Mackenzie Delta, which uh, has a lot of oil and gas discoveries. And again, yeah, we, 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 we cover all that and uh, there's some absolutely amazing fields out there as well. Thanks for sharing some of your, uh, your memories of, uh, of Alaska. You would have liked to have been involved in a, in a major discovery, I, uh, I, I expect. Yes, it was very early in my career and uh, being involved with a world-class discovery would have been an absolute delight. <laughs> But it didn't. It didn't affect you too much. You did all right, despite of it. Eh? <laughs> Thanks very much, Colin, and uh, hope to see you back on this channel before too long. Thank you, Mike. Just like we see in the uh, ice road truck, ice uh, ice so road trucker. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're calling me? <laughs> No, I called you a miserable old. <laughs> we won't use that bit. <laughs>